All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna try to pick up the pace a little bit, because I want to get to uh, end of chapter 15 before reading week. I'm going to try my best to do it without rushing through examples. Um, but that just means that you know, I'm going to try my best to explain the concepts first and foremost. And I might just assume that you can do the calculations on your own when you get home. And you might have to fill a line or two in on your own. Um, but I, I'm going to try to cover as much as possible um, without rushing. So, so what I want to do in this particular class is get to um, examples on the use of principle and work in energy, which we talked about last class, and then also talk about conservation of energy at the end of the class. And then hopefully by next week, I get to do maybe one more energy example and then all momentum from there. Okay, so here, here's where we left off last class, just as a reminder. I put this equation on the board, a really simple one, and I called it the principle of work and energy. Inside this equation, lots and lots of detail, but the highlights are the following. On the left-hand side, you start at a position one. Some object is sitting at a certain location, and we say that this capital T1 is its kinetic energy. And we gave it the 1 half mv squared that you're used to seeing. Then we spent a lot of time developing all the different sorts of work terms. And we said we're going to sum up all these work terms that are applied from position 1 as the particle moves to position 2. And you're going to do them for each and every one of the forces that the object feels. So gravity, friction, spring force, et cetera. Whatever work is being done on the particle in a positive manner adds to that kinetic energy, giving you kinetic energy final, which usually means the particle is moving faster. Okay? So that is the principle of work and energy that we have now at our disposal. So here's our first example. And what does it mean for this example? The first example is I'm going to go back to this incline, but I'm going to make it a lot simpler. So no, no springs or no, and no forces pushing on it. What I will say is that the mass is just given an initial velocity. And that initial velocity is v1, 12 meter per second. Mass is 20 kilograms. So you gave it a nudge, and then you let go. This was the number that's given to you. The surface has a particular mu k. And you're asked to find the following. Find s max up the incline. s max meaning how far does it go up the incline before it stops, right? So when it says s max. What you're really looking for is where is it where v2 at position 2 up at the top, where does it stop and become 0? Okay. Then we're going to let the mass slide back down the incline, assuming that it doesn't get stuck. And we ask you, what do you think the velocity of 3 is where 3 and 1 are the exact same spot? So the mass goes up the incline, stops, comes back down, lands on the exact same starting point. What is its final velocity then? OK? Yeah? Sorry, I just want okay. okay. So, what if you want the sum of potential equals mu equals t2? Yeah. What happens if you have position 3 that's also like gravitational potential? Yeah, well, so we'll, we'll get to that, OK? So, don't worry about it. I'm going to get to all of those details later. Just focus on one example at a time. Um, so, let's, 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 let's take care of this. Now, why, why am I doing this particular problem in this section? Here's, here's the clue when you want to use work and energy. Okay? Use, and I'm going to abbreviate this, principle of work and energy. That's my PWE, right? Use that when you have forces, velocities, and displacements. OK? So when you see forces and a lot of information on velocities and how far things are traveling, there's your clue that you're going to use work and energy as probably the best approach. Why? Because it avoids everything associated with acceleration. You don't have to calculate acceleration if you don't need to. And you can see here that all of the questions and all the information we're giving you, velocity, 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 and distance traveled. So let's see what principle of work and energy can do for us. S max. OK, so to get to S max, the idea is take the first part of the question, 
as path from point one to point two. What that means is you're going to write the t1 plus sum of u to 1 is equal to t2. But this means that we have to figure out what all the forces are that are acting on that, on that mass. So free body diagram. Free body diagram of the mass as it goes up. We've got mg down, got obviously fn pointing perpendicular to the surface, and kinetic friction force acting opposite the direction of motion FF. Right? Okay, so you can do your, you can do your force balance, uh, and you're going to see that you know, sum of forces in the x, max, is equal to negative mu k fn oops, minus mg, and that would be sine of 20 degrees. Oops. And then we know that fn has to be related to my y direction. So this would be fn is minus mg cos 20, and that's 0 because the object is not moving in the y direction. So you put all that together, and we know exactly what, what, this, what this force in the x direction is. Okay? Okay, so the sum of the forces in the x direction then should be negative mu k mg cos 20 minus mg sine 20. That's your sum of forces in the x. OK? So if that is the sum of forces acting in the x, that goes in here multiplied by the displacement. So here's our principle of work and energy. I'm going to now write 1 half mv1 squared. Then I'm going to add. All of these forces are actually constant, which allows me to just integrate and multiply by distance. So it becomes negative mu k mg cos 20 minus mg sine 20, right? Multiplied by the distance up the incline, s max, which is what we need to solve for is equal to 1 half mv2 squared, but that is 0, right? OK? So you, you see how that was developed and, and how, how actually how easy it was, how straightforward it was using this equation for this particular problem. Um, and it's all, all due to the fact that once you've identified there is no acceleration that needs to be solved, this is the best approach to do it. OK, so I'm going to rearrange, and then you're going to be left with S max is equal to 15.2 meters. And like I said, I'll leave, the, I'll leave the substitutions to you when you get home. Yeah? Um, when you say S max, are you talking about the total distance from the ground? Are uh, you talking about the total displacement from M1? Yeah, I, I, I forgot to add that to the diagram. This is my S max. It's the displacement. OK? I should probably just call it delta, delta S max, to be clear. OK? OK. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? OK, so now, now on to part B. Right? Part B basically says, now I'm interested in going back the other way and figuring out how much velocity the mass will get when it gets back to the first spot. The first, the first spot. Now that you know the distance traveled, you can pretty much just use the same distance except for the fact that the free body diagram is actually different when it comes back down. Right? So be very, very careful here. The idea is once it comes back down, because it's moving down now, the friction force is actually pointing up. 
And that changes the sign of one of the terms in your equation. The sign that gets changed, now that x is moving, now that it's moving in this direction, I'm going to say sum of forces in the x, where, for instance, this might be my positive now, going down the incline. This is now mg sine 20 minus mu k, minus mu k mg cos 20. Okay? So you see, you see what happened there? Basically, it looks exactly like this equation, except in this equation, both forces were negative, pointing opposite the direction of motion. In this case, one of them is positive, one of them is negative, and that changes everything. That basically means now, if I Now I'm going to do the following. I'll write T2, top of the hill, top of the incline, plus work done is equal to final location T3. Okay? So if you write that as your principle of work and energy, you've got 1 half mv2 squared. This one is still 0 because it started at the top from rest. Then we're going to add that mg sine 20 minus mu k mg cos 20, right? And we multiply that to the s max that we just solved for, so the 15.2. And we make this equal to 1 half mv3 squared. Everything else is known except for v3. Solving for v3. And v3 gives you 7.74 meters per second. So, there, so there's your part A and part B of the problem. Pretty simple. Any, any questions on that? Yeah? The block is moving in the opposite direction. That part is fine. That part, as long as you're staying consistent with your signs, everything will work out. Okay. By, by, the, by the way, I'm switching, I'm switching signs because, because why? The, the work term, remember this work term that we were, we were doing in the, in the beginning of the section? What did I say about the integral? I said the integral was s1, s2, and it was f cos theta ds, right? And it came from a dot product. And the dot product was such that if the force acts in the direction of displacement, positive. Right? So the way that I wrote this was to ensure that this is positive, this is negative, because you're moving down the incline. That's your direction of displacement. And this is the right order to keep your, to keep your positive, negative correct. So that's the, that's the reason why we had to flip it like that. Okay? So remember, just everything is scalar, so you just got to keep track of the positives and the negatives. Okay? Now, one more thing, what did, you, what did you notice here in terms of the answer of velocity by the time it came back down the hill? Right, right, so it's the, the, key, the key point here is this is a scalar, this is the speed of the block, we've taken into account the signs, and it's 7.74 down the incline, and it is smaller than 12 meters per second. So it slowed down, right? And it slowed down because of friction, clearly. But do the, num do the numbers actually agree with the amount of energy that was lost due to friction? That should be your check, OK? So how do we check that? Here's your check. Remember how I said friction changed directions. 
So it, not only did it go 15.2 meters up, it went 15.2 meters down. So if I wanted to calculate U, work done by friction, it is exactly like this, mu k fn, which is mg cos 20. I take that and I have to multiply it by 15.2, multiply it twice. Okay? That is the amount, total amount of work done by the friction force slowing down the mass, both directions. And what is the value that I get for the friction work being done? It agrees, it basically is 800 and, so it's negative, negative 841 joules, okay? Because the distance traveled is opposite the direction of the force, so it's negative. And what does this negative 841 joules mean? It means that if I were to compare the kinetic energy from point 0.1 to point 0.3, the final and the initial, the difference should be negative 841. And so you can check this. T1 is mv1 squared, and it would be 20 times the 12 squared. And T3 is 1 half mv3 squared is equal to 1 half 27.74 squared. Okay, and if you subtract these two, T3 minus T1, it would be 841 joules. Okay, so the change in the total kinetic energy of the mass matches that that was lost directly due to friction. Okay, any, any questions on that? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so there's your first application of principle of work and energy. So now, that was the case for just one particular particle. How do you do it if there's a problem that involves two particles moving simultaneously? So I've got an example here that's like a pulley example. And we think of this as a system of two particles. So imagine the following. We've got a frictionless rod. And one of these uh, sliding collars on the frictionless rod, B. Okay, and... And I'm going to make it a pulley problem like that. OK, so here's what's going to happen. There's a, there's a tiny pulley here that moves with B. This pulley is fixed to B. OK, so it's going to slide, and it's going to end up over here, okay, and the pulley is going to move with it, and the rope is going to get longer like this, okay, and once the B moves in this direction, A has to move up, okay, so I'm going to make this my positive A, and this is my positive B, but there's basically two moving objects, they're connected and linked by a rope, which means you're going to have to use some dependent motion analysis. And we tell you the following. So we say that we drag this pulley over with a force, P, and that there is an initial distance right here from the wall 
to the edge of the collar, and we call that D. OK, and so here are, here's all the information we've got. P is a force which is constant, 150 newtons. There's a distance of the collar from the wall. Starts at 0 0.6 meters. Mass of the block, 3 kilograms. Mass of the collar. 8 kilograms, and everything starts from rest. So VA at 1 is 0, VB of 1 is also 0. Okay, so the whole thing starts at rest, and then you're asked to find the following find speed of mass B. just before it hits the wall. OK? All right, so how do you, how do you tackle this? OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say your first logical step should be free body diagrams as usual, right? OK, so, so if I did free body diagrams for both of these, I'd imagine you would have your block A with an MAG, and then you would have tension in the rope, right? And then over here for your collar B, looks to me like you've actually got, you've got something hanging down below here, but it's two tensions, right? Both tensions are, are from the rope. It's because it's looped around that pulley. So there's two tensions pulling on that pulley, and the pulley is attached to the collar. So there's two T's here, and there's a P this way, OK? So it looks to me like you've got two diagrams. Uh, now you can, work, you can work all this out. You could do MBAB is your P minus 2T. Your MAAA is T minus MAG. And you can even do your pulley analysis, your dependent motion. And because it loops around that pulley once, Every inch that B moves, A is going to move two inches, right? So you're going to actually end up with AA is equal to 2AB as your accelerations. OK? Pretty, pretty basic stuff. You've got your three equations, three unknowns. And you're well on your way, except for the fact that you still have to solve this and you've got some accelerations here, then you've got to go back and do velocities because you have to find the speed of MB. That was the final thing. So what did I say about last problem? What did I say was the key to using the principle of work and energy? Was that if you know forces, velocities, and displacements, principle of work and energy will get you there faster. OK, so this is definitely doable. But I would say that you've got interesting things here like tension that you have to solve, et cetera. So here's my, here's my suggestion to you. Apply principle of work and energy on the entire system. On the entire system of the two particles. OK? And here's what you'll find. What are the forces that actually do work? The only forces that do work in this problem are actually P, 
because it's moving a distance, distance d, and gravity on A. Those are the only two forces. What happened to tension? Why is there tension when I did this? Does tension do any work? No, tension is an internal force of the system, right? It only occurred because I had to isolate tension for mass A and mass B, revealing like an internal force, right? But if I kept the entire system together, not cutting the rope and re revealing that tension, tension is actually an internal force with action and reaction happening in opposite directions. And when it travels a certain distance, both positive and negative forces cancel each other out. So you don't actually have to solve for tension. We can just use entire system of two particles. And I can write my principle of work and energy like this. I can do T1 plus sum of work done is equal to T2, but I do this. Sum of I, sum of I, sum of I, where this is my mathematical symbol for summation across all I particles in the system. So across I number of particles in the system. Okay, pretty, pretty useful. So what, where, do I, where do I go from here? I'm just going to show you the end result of this equation when I write it all down. Okay, so if I take this principle of work and energy and I write it for, in this particular case, two particles, I expect to write T1 for both A and B, et cetera. Everything for A and B together. So it should be like this. TA1 plus TB1, right? Plus sum of the U1 to 2 for A plus sum of u1 to 2 for b. And then this would be equal to ta at 2 plus tb at 2. Basically, everything is just additive, and you incorporate the a and the, two, the, a and the b together. OK, does that make sense? OK, so if that makes sense, then here we go. We're going to start plugging in some numbers. So the first thing is everything started at rest, right? V1 for A and B were 0. So those are 0, right? And then what forces were acting on A? Only gravity and only for a certain distance. So I'm going to write here, this is going to be 0 plus 0. And then I'm going to add. Negative mg multiplied by how far a moved, right? So this a moved, this is probably just going to be a delta sa, like that. OK. And then I'm going to look at the amount of the, the work done on b. This is going to be plus constant force P being applied over a distance D, right before it hits the wall. All right. And then this is going to be 1 half MVA squared plus MAVA squared, 1 half MBVB squared. And am I missing something? I'm missing the, the, the subscript A here for MA, right? MAG. Okay, and here's the relationships from dependent motion analysis from the pulley. Right? I already explained it. B moves one inch and A has to move two. So we know that for sure delta SA must be equal to twice as much as d. So this is 2d. So this must be 1.2 meters. 
And we know that VA must also be equal to 2VB. And so I can sub in one of those in here, and you can solve. So I'll just finally write it all out for you. This is going to be P times D minus MAG 9.81 delta SA 1.2. Is equal to one half three v two v b all squared and then plus one half eight v b squared. Right? That's your full thing. And then I've already substituted the VA and the VB. So VB VB is 2.34 meters per second. Final answer. Any questions on that? Big takeaway, right? Big takeaway is you can actually apply this to more than one particle at a time and actually is more useful and gets you the answer qu quicker if you remember to ignore things like internal forces, right? OK. So that leaves me 15 minutes to talk about the last section if there are no questions. OK, so this is going to be an answer to your question, right? What about this idea that you've been used to for a long time from high school, potential energy and the use of conservation of energy laws? Right? So that, that's completely tied to this. I'm going to show you how we get there from everything that we've talked about so far. This is, I believe, section 14.5, conservation of energy. So. All right. So I want, you, I want you guys to look at a pattern here. OK? The pattern is as follows. We did work for gravity. And when I, when I derived this equation, it looked like this. OK? And I could actually expand this out, and it would look like Right? It would just look like that. In fact, let me just get rid of that. Let's say plus. Right? Pretty simple. If I do spring force, spring force was uh, 1 half k, like so. I do want to correct something I said last class. I think I said something to, to the effect of ignore the unstretched length. My mistake, S is obviously the stretch length, right, always. So it's stretched from the unstretched length. So S is always measured from S is equal to 0, where the 0 is its natural unstretched length, right? So I probably misspoke last class. But that's the, that's the true definition of this equation. And what you also notice is the fact that I can write this as this. Right? I, can see, I seem to be able to separate them into these two terms. And the only one that doesn't really work when I do that is friction force. Because if I do friction, it's always going to be you know, friction force multiplied by the distance traveled total. Right? We just did a problem where the friction force flipped, and we have to add the whole thing. So this is the case where like, if you have a particle that changes direction, 
you need to take the total S into account, right? Total S total, right? So it has to be the whole thing. And what that means is, if I went back and forth, ended up at the same spot, this delta S is not 0, OK? OK, so what I want to do is I want to separate these two into different categories. And I want to deal with gravity and spring force together. And I want to introduce this idea of the potential energy. So what we do is you first say, let me define potential energy. Right? And you can define it as a particular form of this equation, of the term, at one given location as long as you have a reference point. So the way we define potential energy for gravity is we simply say this. We say we'll call it V, V for potential energy, Vg. And we say the following. It's equal to plus mgy. Okay. So why did we do it that way? Basically what it's saying is the following. At, at y is equal to 0, we are basically saying this is our reference point, our datum line, if you will. Right? y is equal to 0, or any other reference point happens to be 0 potential energy. And if y is above this 0 point, it has or possesses this potential energy. And if you look here, what that means is if there is a ball, and the ball started here where y1 was high, like above the ground, and y2 was 0, you could see that it would first possess positive potential energy. And then as it fell, it would end up with no potential energy. So that's how we would define it. Okay? And likewise, we could do the same thing for spring. All right. okay? where, where we could do the following. We could say v spring, so this is potential energy for spring. Right? And actually, we usually say that this is elastic potential energy. This would be positive 1 half k s squared. OK? So what does that mean? If s is 0, unstretched length of spring, no force, it has no elastic potential energy. OK? You can't store any energy that way. But as long as S is displaced, either compressed or stretched by any amount, you would end up with a positive amount of potential energy, and it would try to return to its original shape. Okay? So if I, if I define these two terms this way, here's what my principle of work and energy would look like. I could actually get to a different form of the equation. So I'm going to do the following. Okay. So I'm going to say, here's the concept. Using these definitions, I am now going to replace my work terms with energy terms. So UG is now going to be V1 minus uh, VG1 minus VG2. Okay. Right? Just look at, look at the way my signs are working. I'm basically saying ball starts higher above the ground, positive minus when it hits the ground 0. From 1 to 2, positive min 1 minus 2. Okay? And this will be mgy1 minus mgy2. And for us, I'm going to substitute this as vs1 minus vs2. Right? And that's exactly what I wrote there. 1 half ks1 squared minus 1 half ks2 squared. And now I'm going to plug it into my principle of work and energy. And here's what it would look like. T1 plus all of these things, all of my work terms. Right. So let me say it should be ug 
plus us plus uf, and even like ups and things, whatever you applied forces, et cetera, is equal to T2. OK? Now I'm going to plug in my Vs in here. T1 plus Vg1 minus Vg2 plus Vs1 minus Vs2 plus work by friction, which I have left untouched, is equal to T2. OK? And all of a sudden, you'll notice that all of the that the potential energies for position two have a negative sign in front of it. So I'm going to group them all together and move them to the other side. Okay, and what do you get? You're going to get the following. T1 plus Vg1 plus Vg2. Oh, sorry, Vs1 plus Uf T2 plus Vg2 plus Vs2. Okay? Okay, so what does this really say? It says for special cases of forces where you could do that separation, position one, position two, independent of if it goes back and forth. All of the ones in position one get grouped together on the left side. All the ones in position two get grouped together on the right side. You're just left with these types of forces that are like friction that can't be, done, that can't be separated like that. So what we call friction is we call friction a non-conservative force okay so these non-conservative forces once you've identified them they get special treatment they never they never get broken up into two two pieces like that but these ones the gravity and the spring forces they are considered conservative forces okay so let us define what it means to be a conservative force. Conservative forces are any force any force acting on particle is called conservative if work done from 1 to 2 is independent of path. Okay, so you see what the you see what this means. It basically means I could have a particle that starts here at one, and if we ask the question, what is the change in the gravity in the work done by gravity? If the particle did this, right, and ended back at the same spot, doesn't matter what the path was, the work done by gravity was zero because it ended up back in the exact same spot. So independent of path, this is true for the springs and the gravities, but this is clearly not true for the frictions. Okay, so here's my conservation of energy law, and then I'll do an example next class. So conservation of energy says following T1 plus V1. So all kinetic energy plus all potential energy <coughs> plus all 
plus any work done from 1 to 2 by non-conservative forces, such as friction, must be equal to T2 plus V2. Okay? Where V1 and V2, we basically, you would have to do both the spring and the gravity to get to the total potential energy in that case. Okay? And then the special case is when you have problems that are frictionless. So this last problem here with the pulley, I told you that the rod was frictionless. So if non-conservative forces are negligible, then T1 plus V1 is equal to T2 plus V2. And that's the conservation of energy with no friction or no non-conservative forces, right? And so I'll give you an example, a quick one. You're going to start seeing this a lot. This is obviously just like the principle of work and energy, really, really simple until you start unpacking it. You're going to start seeing things like this. MAVA1 squared plus 1 half MBVB1 squared, right? Plus 1 half KS1 squared plus MGH1, right? Is equal to 0 plus 0 plus 1 half KS2 squared, etc. Basically, this is your nice, neat way before you get to expand it out for all these different problems including all the different types of potential energy and kinetic energies. Does that make sense? All right, right on time. OK, no more final, final questions? All good? I need to do a couple of examples next class, but hopefully I'll get to wrap that up. And then I'll move on to chapter 15, which is momentum. And then that will carry us all the way through to the end of the week. And then you'll have your reading week. OK? All right, thanks very much. Have a good weekend.